We just saw evaluating a, an expression. And of course, that was a very simple one, but in essence, it would be no different if, if it was some big nest of expressions. There would just be deeper recursion on the stack. But what I want to do now is show you the last piece. I want to walk you around this eval apply loop. Right, that's the thing we haven't seen, really. We haven't seen any compound procedures where evaluation of a procedure reduces to applying, where applying a procedure reduces to evaluating the body of the procedure. So let's just suppose we had this. Suppose we were looking at the procedure define uh, f of a and b to be the sum of a and b. So as we typed in that procedure previously, and now we're going to evaluate f of x and y, again, in this environment, e0, where x is bound to 3 and y is bound to 4. When the define is executed, remember there's a lambda here, and lambdas create procedures. And basically, what will happen is in E0, we'll end up with a binding for f, which will say f is a procedure, and its args are a and b, and its body is plus a, b. So that's what the environment would have looked like had we made that definition. Then when we go to evaluate f of x and y, we'll go through exactly the same process that we did before. It's even the same expression. The only difference is that f, instead of having primitive plus in it, will have, have this thing. And so we'll go through exactly the same process, except this time when we end up at apply dispatch. The function register, instead of having primitive plus, will have a th thing that will represent as saying procedure, where the args are a and b, and the body is plus a, b. And again, what I mean is by it's in it, I mean there's a pointer to it. So don't worry that I'm writing a lot of stuff there. There's a pointer to this procedure data structure. OK, so we're in exactly the same situation when we get back, when we get to apply dispatch. Okay. So here we, we come to apply dispatch. Last time, we branched off to a primitive procedure. Here it says, oh, we have now have a compound procedure. So we're going to go off to compound apply. Now, what's compound apply? Well, remember what the metacircular evaluator did. Compound apply said we're going to evaluate the body of the procedure in some new environment. Where does that new environment come from? We take the environment that was packaged with the procedure. We bind the parameters of the procedure to the arguments that we're passing in and use that as a new frame to extend the procedure environment. And that's the environment in which we evaluate the procedure body. Right? That's, the, that's going around the, the apply eval loop. That's apply coming back to call eval. Right? Okay. So now that's all we have to do in compound apply. What are we going to do? We're going to manufacture an, a new environment we're going to manufacture a new environment that I, let's see, that we'll call E1. E1 is going to be some environment where the, where the parameters of the procedure, where A is bound to, to 3 and B is bound to 4, and it's linked to E0 because that's where F is defined. And in this environment, we're going to evaluate the body of the procedure. So let's look at that. Right, we're going to. But here we are at compound apply, which says assign to the expression register the body of the procedure that's in the function register. So I assign to the expression register the procedure body. Okay. 
that's going to be evaluated in an environment which is formed by making some bindings using information determined by the procedure, that's what's in fun, and the argument list. Let's not worry about exactly what that does, but you can see the information's there. So make bindings will say, oh, the procedure itself had an environment attached to it. I didn't write that quite here. I should have said in environment, because every procedure gets built with an environment. So from that environment, it knows what the procedure's definition environment is. It knows what the arguments are. It looks at Argle, and then you see a reversal convention here. It just has to know that Argle is reversed. And it builds this frame E1. All right, so let's assume that that's what make bindings returns. So it assigns to env this thing E1. All right, the next thing it says is restore continue. Remember what continue was here? It got put up in the last segment. Continue got stored. That was the original done, which said, what are you going to do after you're done with this particular application? It's one of the very first things that happened when we evaluated the application. And now finally, we're going to restore continue. Remember, applied dispatch is contract. It assumes that where it should go to next was on the stack, and there it was on the stack. Continue has done. And now we're going to go back to a val dispatch. We're set up again. We have a, an expression, an environment, and a place to go to. I'm not going to go through that, because right, it's sort of the same expression. Okay. But the thing, again, to notice is at this point, we have reduced the original expression, fxy. Right, we've reduced evaluating fxy in environment E0 to evaluate plus AB in E1. And notice nothing's on the stack. Right? It's a reduction. At this point, the machine does not contain as part of its state the fact that it's in the middle of evaluating some procedure called F. That's gone. Right? There's no accumulated state. Okay, that's, Again, that's a very important idea. That's the meaning of when we used to write in the substitution model, this expression reduces to that expression. And you don't have to remember anything. And here you see the meaning of reduction. At this point, there is nothing on the stack. See, that has very important consequences. Let's go back and look at, look at iterative factorial. Right, remember, this was some sort of loop and do an iter. And we kept saying that's an iterative procedure. Right? And what we wrote, right, what we wrote, remember, right, are things like, like we said, it fact iter of five. We wrote things like reduces to iter of 1 and 1 and 5, which reduces to iter of 1 and 2 and 5, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we kept saying, well, look, you don't have to build up any storage to do that. And we waved our hands and said, in principle, there's no storage needed. Now you see no storage needed. Each of these is a real reduction. Right? As you walk through, right, as you walk through these expressions, Right, as, you walk through these exp as you walk through these expressions, what you'll see are these expressions on the stack in some particular environment, and then these expressions in the, sorry, in the X register in some particular environment. And at each point, there'll be no accumulated stuff on the stack, because each one's a real reduction. Right. So for example, just to go through it in a little bit more care, if I start out with an expression that says something like, uh, Say, say fact iter of five in some environment. Right. Right. 
that will at some point create an environment in which n is bound to 5. Let's call that. And at some point, the machine will reduce to the expression, reduce this whole thing to a thing that says that's really iter of 1 and 1 and n evaluated in this environment E1 with nothing on the stack. See, at this moment, the machine is not remembering that evaluating this expression iter, which is the loop, is part of this thing called iterative factorial. It's not remembering that. It's just reduced the expression to that. Right? If we look again right at the body of iterative factorial, this expression has reduced to that expression. Oh, I shouldn't have the n there. Slightly different convention from the slide to the program. Okay. Okay. And then, right, what's the body of iter? Well, iter is going to be an if. And I won't go through the details of if. It'll evaluate the predicate. In this case, it'll be false. And this iter will now reduce to the expression, right, iter of whatever it says, star counter product and, what does it say, plus counter 1 in some other environment by this time E2, where E2 will be set up having bindings for product and counter. Right? And it'll reduce to that. But it won't be remembering that it's part of something that it has to return to. And when iter calls iter again, it'll reduce to another thing that looks like this, right? in some environment E3, which has new bindings for product and counter. Okay, so uh, if you're wondering, see, if you've always been queasy about, about how it is we've been saying those procedures that look syntactically recursive are, are in fact iterative, run in constant space. Well, I don't know if this makes you less queasy, but at least it shows you what's happening. There really isn't any buildup there. Now, you might ask, well, is there buildup in principle in these environment frames? And the answer is, yeah, you have to make these new environment frames, but you don't have to hang on to them when you're done. They can be garbage collected, or the space can be reused automatically. But you see, the control structure of the evaluator is really using this idea that you actually have a reduction. So these procedures really are iterative procedures. All right, let's stop for questions. All right, let's break.